Donaldsonville, and WDGL, HD2, Baton Rouge. Game day is on the air. Presented by Super Chevy, your local Super Chevy dealers. It's time to talk LSU football on the flagship home of the Tigers. Call 225-499-9898. It's Eagle 98.1 game day. Now, live from the Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge Studios, here's Charles Hanegriff and Richard Dixon. Demolished and embarrassed. Alabama 42 and LSU 13. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Eagle 98.1 game day. I'm Charles Hanegraaff along with Richard Dixon. Friends, I got to tell you, I've been at this a while. It's pretty much, uh, you know, the uh, way that we do this show. We talk about uh, how the game unfolded. We talk about the key plays in the game. We talk about some of the things we might have done differently. We talk about matchups. We talk about the external factors, whether it be the crowd or the weather or an injury or, or whatever. And then we, we take some calls and we get your opinion. I could go through that format tonight. Works. You know, been, like I said, been at this a while. But it ain't there. It, it ain't there tonight. There's no use in doing that. Because what I saw tonight was one of the more shocking outcomes since I've been doing this. I like to feel like I have a pretty good pulse on the team. We, we watch them, you know, from the beginning of August all the way through in spring. And we talk to people. We watch that. I, I feel like I'm prepared for most outcomes. And it can be in a wide range. But I wasn't prepared for what I saw tonight. Because what I saw tonight, and I, I don't I'm not wild about hyperbole. You know, I I don't like sitting next to the guy at the basketball game who sixteen whistles in a row says that's the worst call I've ever seen in my life. Okay. Doesn't do anything for me. It kind of loses its effect after a while. But what I saw tonight was the most unprepared football team. Not just of the Brian Kelly era, but since I've been doing this, I don't know that I've seen a team that was more bewildered. Now, understand what I'm saying here. I've seen LSU teams that were out-talented, okay? I lived through the 90s, man. I watched Curly Holman's team play Steve Spurrier's team. I know what happens when you're outmanned. I've seen them get out-schemed. I lived through the Les Miles era. Sorry, Rich. Okay, there, there were there, there were times this one tops it there, 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 there were times where, you know, Alabama knew what was coming. All right. I've seen games where, look, this was just a terrible matchup. What they do well, you don't do well. I've seen some routes. I've seen teams come out flat. But I have never seen a team for a game of this mag, not the hell with the game of this magnitude. I've never seen an LSU team, period, come out looking as the, the only word I can come up with is bewildered. They looked like they got together at about four o'clock this afternoon and said, "Hey, let's go over to the football stadium and see if we can play a game." I made one post during the game, which is one more than I usually make. And the the post was that they looked bewildered. And honestly, we, we get this on post game shows. Like I said, uh, you know, for, for all of the calls we've taken over the years, you, you get the, what the hell they've been practicing out there? I don't know. I honestly watched this team tonight. And if you told me they didn't practice at all the last two weeks, I would have believed you. And Brian Kelly used those exact words in the post game an hour and a half later. I've never seen a group come out more ill prepared to play a football game. I really haven't. They looked like they didn't know whether a football was blown up or stuffed. It was like they had never considered the idea that Jalen Milrow might beat him with his feet, even though it was overwhelming evidence to suggest that you could have looked at last year's game. You could have looked at 
the game two weeks ago. Those were prime examples of how a running quarterback demolished you. Yet there seemed to be genuine astonishment at some of the plays that they looked at. Offensively, you had no running game again, save for one big run at the beginning. You had a quarterback that panicked on a number of occasions. You got crushed in the trenches on both sides. You had everything lined up for you. Big-time opponent, big-time atmosphere, good weather, the whole thing. Tiger Stadium at its best. And you went out there and did that. I'll be honest with you. My confidence in Brian Kelly is rattled, and I'm not. I'm not trying to get into big picture and all that stuff. He's a coach. He's he's been an excellent coach for a long time. He's won a bunch of games. But if your response to the second half at Texas A&M with Alabama coming here, with everything that is on the line, if that was your response then my confidence in your ability to prepare a football team to play in a big game is rattled. Because that was a disgusting performance. It was, uh, I, I had, embarrassing is another word that gets overused. Oh, they, you know, they got beat by two touchdowns. They were embarrassed. No, they just got beat. Okay, sometimes that happens. No, I'm embarrassed. Okay, well, no, no. Tonight, embarrassed is is it's a strong word, and it it absolutely uh, applies here tonight. Um, I I was actually at, at times just bewildered myself of what I was watching, Rich, and so I, I can tell you about a face mask penalty that cost him or a holding penalty. I don't want to hear another him. person talk about the penalties because I got on Twitter today, whatever it is, X. In the whole first half, they're like, oh, that, that, that was a targeting or that was a penalty. Look, we played like absolute dog yeah. crap tonight. I mean, it, it was god awful. I, I, I was really trying to be calm. I was trying to settle down before I got here. But it, I was embarrassed as an LSU football player tonight. That was the most unprepared team I've ever seen, the most unenthusiastic team I've seen on that field. I mean, when, look, Garrett Nussmeyer has played some good football here, but. His last six quarters has been as bad as we've seen as a quarterback when you make these situations. And then when you smile after you throw your second interception in a bad situation, it just it, it makes me so mad because we can sit here and dog trash the defense all day long. But five of the last seven touchdowns scored on LSU is because the offense put them in a terrible position. I mean, Nussmeyer has given them the ball three times against A&M on the plus side of the field. He does it again tonight. It, it is it's so frustrating because I, I get what everybody's saying. Yes, Milrow rushed for 185 yards today. That's I get it. That's something we have not done well. But we keep putting the defense in bad situations. Defense played great on first and second down. We get into situations tonight, the first drive of the game, the crowd's going crazy. We get an offsides penalty. We stop them on first down, stop, or first and second. We give up a long third. And th- those situations are, are very frustrating. This defense – I'm comparing it to last year. This defense is so much better than last year, and yet we're talking about this. But the offense is so much worse than it was last year because we put our defense in a lot of bad situations. The unpreparedness uh, for Milrow, for any type of other offensive options that you might have had, that they would have ever considered that they might throw the ball to running backs, which they did repeatedly. Uh, we we in were the first scared half. to death of Williams going deep. And, and, and Milrow, and then we gave up the entire middle of the field. When we did rush Milrow, he dumped it off and nobody covered anybody in the middle of the field. And, not for nothing, but Williams beat him deep twice. Milrow just missed oh, him. The score should have been worse yeah, early yeah, on. I, I, absolutely. They lost 42-13, to 13, and Alabama could have put 60 if they hit a no couple doubt. other plays. Because if they were trying not to uh, let Williams get deep, oh, he got deep on him. Milro just missed him. Yeah, there, there was at least twice. Um, I'm like I said, I'm I'm really, I'm I'm not often stunned. Okay, I've seen bad game plans before, where you know, 2011 national championship game was yeah. the rock bottom for most people. It, it was as good as that team was, and you went out there with this brain dead game plan, you know. But at least I knew what they were trying to do. I knew that they were trying to replicate 
what had happened in the game in November when they had won, and they got out they got out coached by the best to ever do it. But at least I understood what they were trying to do. I didn't understand anything about tonight. Not not a damn thing did I understand about what LSU was trying to do. We didn't replicate anything on offense tonight that looked anything like what we've done positive in the previous eight games. I mean, it, it made no sense to me. We got off the ball. Look, I text you. We went to pistol. We break a long run. We, we kind of change things up. Then we run a screen out to the left. We did a few things different. And then we panicked. We put Josh Williams back there. We do pass protection. We, we run the same run game. And then I don't know. Look, I, I got to go back. I do not want to watch this film. I got to go back and watch this film. But there was nothing beyond 10 yards that we could get to. I mean, it, it was a check down city all night long. And Nussmeier couldn't make anything happen. This one was was was, was tough, uh, and then when all after all that was said and done, we got to coach better. You, you, yeah, well, you, you, you got to you show out in the fourth quarter where you don't want to tackle anybody anymore. You packed it in. He could say that. Well, they they didn't quit. They played till the end. Eh, I was more uh, embarrassed. defensively. I, I I think that I think that they packed it in. in I the was more quarter. embarrassed getting beat the way we were, not putting in the backups running the ball, finishing the game. What what you do in a respectable loss. Mm. He's trying to put up points at the end of the game he to, to try to make down. it not look worse. He, he you, wanted to score a touchdown. When you got, yeah. yeah, but at that point, you got all the starters in with seven. I don't give oh, a no, damn. I, oh, no, I'm he scored with you. a touchdown I'm, with 17 I'm, seconds I'm with, left. Absolutely. That's I'm, actually dog trash. Actually, it's more embarrassing because that backup defense of Alabama whipped your O-line's ass in that last play of the game. Will Campbell – Emory Jones, your first round, every single one of them got their ass whooped on that last drive. They got embarrassed. And then you're trying to put up points with 17 seconds left in the game when you're down four scores, five scores, whatever it is. That that was more embarrassing than the whole previous three quarters of the game. I sat through 58 to three. Okay. I sat through 21 to nothing. I sat through 30 to 27 in Auburn in 1994. This one's right up there, but uh, this one is right up there with the the worst losses that I have said because, the, for like I said, for the first time, it, it I knew what they were trying to do in Auburn in 94. It was stupid, but I knew what they were trying to do. I knew what they were trying to do in 11. It was stupid, but I knew what they were trying to do. I know what they're trying to do tonight. It literally looked like they showed up 30 minutes before the game and threw the uniforms on and went out there and said, hey, let's let's go do this. Because it didn't look like they had spent one second preparing for this game. And that's as honest as I can put it. 499-9898 is the number to call on the LaBearish hotline. We'll take your phone calls. This is Eagle 98.1 Game Day. Eagle 98.1. Eagle 98.1 game day continues. Alabama wins at 42 to 13. 499 98 98 is the number on the LaBerge hotline. Elliot is in Watson to start us off. Elliot, welcome into the show. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Look, um, Alabama's coaching staff, minus Saban, treated LSU's coaching staff tonight like President Trump did on her knees, Harris, on Tuesday. It's time for Kelly to go, MAGA. Okay, so let's let's. It's let, not gonna happen, right? Let me let me just stop you right there, okay? Um, first of all, Kelly's got a ten year contract; he's got seven years left on it. They own seventy million dollars. Yeah, so and that's not gonna happen. All right, if you look at the four big hires from the twenty twenty two season: Lincoln Riley, Billy Napier, Brent Venables, and Brian Kelly. Okay. USC, Oklahoma, Florida, LSU, four big-time blue blood programs. Okay, Kelly's record's better than all of them, and in a couple of cases, significantly better. He's been a longtime coach. Okay, when I posted what I did, they said, "Well, you hadn't watched the games at Notre Dame." There were games at Notre Dame where they were just outgunned. All right, when they when they played Alabama in the national championship game, Vince Lombardi could have come out of the grave. They weren't going to beat that Alabama team. They didn't have enough firepower. Um. And maybe there were some games that he coached at Notre Dame that were were lousy. And yes, I'm aware of the season openers, but this one to me was way worse. All right, my my confidence in him is is shaken a little bit, but he's not going anywhere. 
and it's going to be up to him to to get it fixed. But I I would like to hear something a little bit more substantive than we got to coach better. And I say that knowing that there is nothing that he could have said after that game tonight yeah. that would have made me feel better. But okay. I, I'm starting to get into and like I'm not running numbers to numbers, but like we talk about Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. They play. They win ten games. They win nine games. But every time we've had to win, when the playoffs were on the line or when something was on the line, we go back to his first year when they beat Alabama, they beat Arkansas in a sloppy game. But there's a shot to make the playoffs there. You got to beat A&M, a terrible A&M, and we play like dog trash and we lose. Yeah. This is another situation where we're playing, we're, we're at 15. Alabama's at nine. We're playing to get in that top 12. When we have to win a game, we perform like dog trash, and and that's the most frustrating thing to me. This is two weeks in a row. Last week, first place in the SEC was on the line. This week, a the must win a, games, a, 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 a playoff spot don't show up is yeah is is going to be on the table for you if you win, and you threw up on yourself. Max is in Baton Rouge. Max, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, who do you think had better energy tonight, the LSU Tigers or Omar the Tiger? <laughs> I think Omar the Tiger was more relaxed. Yeah, uh, Omar the Tiger didn't seem like uh, he had uh, – It was affected uh, all all that much. On a serious note, though, guys, uh, I didn't know what to expect going into it. Obviously, I heard a lot about it all week. And if you're going to bring back the tradition, bring back the tradition. But to take that Tiger from Florida, to stick him in the wrong corner of the end zone for 20 seconds was just an absolute joke. It was an embarrassment. Everybody in the stadium was confused. And this is 0 for 2 now for our uh, happy Raging Cajun governor. So please stick your nose out of LSU football and let the coach focus on the game during the week. Okay, and my response is that doesn't mean a damn thing about the football. I'm so tired of people talking about this damn tiger. I don't – I don't. I'm trying to be very – Yeah. Not, it, look, I played through the tiger era. Look, when I hear the stories from former players, they played at Florida, they played at Alabama, played at Auburn, and when they tell me that it was intimidating, in, <clears throat> intimidating walking out – that's cool. I never saw the Tiger when I played at LSU. Never once saw the Tiger outside of the, the, the beautiful place we have for him sitting out there. But if I hear another damn fan talk about oh, Jeff Landry, I don't give a damn about Jeff Landry in this damn game. It's got nothing to do with what happened tonight. Quit talking about the damn politics and what happened. Who gives a damn about the Tiger? I'm so sick and tired of that. Let's talk about the football. The football was bad enough. We don't have to talk about where they put the Tiger, when they brought the Tiger out, because uh, that has – no effect on the players on the field. Craig is in New Iberia. Craig, welcome into the show. Yeah, it was a hot garbage. That's the best thing I could I could think about tonight. That was hot garbage. Okay, Nussmar played like garbage for two weeks in a row. I was at the A and M game last week. We had A and M on the ropes, and, and Nussmar brought him back into the game with an interception. His play is is not that of a of a of a of a, of a with Blue Blood, LSU program, uh, Brian Kelly, I'm like you, Brian Kelly's, oh, we got to coach him better, we got to coach him better. But when are you going to start coaching him better? When? When are we going to start? I mean, you're making $10 million a year. If I was making $10 million a year, I'd be damn well better believe I'd be coaching him a lot better. I don't know I'm going to get this aggravated, but I am so pissed off because, I mean, we spent a beautiful day out there. It was great. The weather was supposed to be bad. It wasn't the best weather, but it wasn't terrible. Second half cleared up. And we couldn't get out of our own way to score a touchdown until it's garbage time. I mean, come on, guys. It, it was absolutely trash, trash, trash. And, and look, I, I, I went through the home in years, too, and I totally agree with you. That was the most ill-prepared, under, under-prepared team I have ever seen take the field for LSU. And, you know, like, like you said, you know, to, today number two falls, number four falls. If we beat number nine, guess what? Bam, we were right in the middle of it. We sit comfortably, probably somewhere around nine or ten. You know, win out and you in. But no, what do we do? Trip over our own damn feet. All right, I'm gonna I'm hang up and let, let and listen to you guys. Thanks. Thank you, Craig. Rich, let's talk about Nussmar for a minute. Um, I thought that there was a lot more pressure on him tonight uh, than there was last week. He was at times making throws on the run. So that's part of it, but it doesn't uh, it doesn't explain everything. In fact, I don't know that it explains uh, you know more than just a, a little portion of it. He has regressed in his decision making. Uh, up until a halftime of last week, 
there have been some ups and downs, and yeah, he got bailed out a little bit in the South Carolina game, but there was a lot of good to work with. The last six uh, quarters, he has regressed something terrible, and I don't know exactly why. Maybe you have a better read on that than I do. He just seems to me to be out of rhythm. I mean, he's taking, he's looking for the big play in, instead of taking what's in front of him. There was there was a play tonight that uh, I can't remember if it was like a second and four or third and four. But he goes for the deep shot when Mason Taylor's got the first down, nobody around him. Harp Street he, pointed that one and, out. Yeah, and he I just know, throws it I deep. What play you're I mean, talking about. There, there's multiple plays to where now he's trying to prove that they can throw the ball deep. And it, it's almost like he's forcing things because, I mean, like, and there's a lot of times where he's throwing off his back foot when he doesn't have to. I don't know. So, something's been shooken with him lately. And look, the, the line is. They got more pressure tonight. I think A&M got a little bit more pressure. But we all saw, we saw how he handled South Carolina. I think his mental has been shook since what happened in A&M. I mean, because he bounced back so many times throughout the season when he had bad plays. But against A&M, once things went south, they got worse. And tonight, like he never looked down the field unless he was trying to push it and force something. I mean, he, he did so many things tonight that were so uncharacteristic that it was just a it, – it was an awful performance from him. Okay. Out of rhythm. Let, let me go back to the first drive of the second half. This is the the one that was particularly frustrating. He had run for a first down on that drive. He had completed a third down pass to Aaron Anderson that got him from third and eight to fourth and one. They end up making uh, the the first down on uh, on a quarterback sneak. He completed a ball to Xavion Thomas uh, on a second down in 20 that got him to third and manageable. Then he completed another ball to Anderson that got him to fourth and four. Then it was a really nice throw to Mason Taylor for 12 yards on the fourth and four that got him to first down. Then he completes, I think it was the only ball Lacey caught uh, up until the last drive, that gets him a first down down on the five-yard line. That's a good drive for Nussmeyer. They are at at that point the score is twenty one to six. If you score there and you make it twenty one to thirteen, now you can get the crowd back in the game. He'd had a very good drive. It was a fourteen play drive, both with his feet, which almost never happens, and through the air. They're playing second and goal on the four, and he throws an interception right at the goal line. I don't know if he didn't see him. I don't know if they disguise the coverage. You'll go back and look at the film and we'll get a a better idea. But that was a drive where he was in rhythm, where he was making good decisions, where he was making good plays. And then you said something during the break that was awful but funny, I guess, uh, that they're more likely to score from the 50 than than from the 5. They get to the 5-yard line, the 4-yard line, and he throws this awful pick. So where does that come from? It's because there's, there's no confidence in a running game. Running game rules red zone offenses. You got to be able to run it, or you got to have a quarterback that can freaking look somebody off, make something move. Because you're you're working with so many less yards. Everybody's compact, and and this team, look, I'm the offense line is garbage at run blocking. There's nothing they can do. I'm I'm tired of trying to disguise it. We talk about a great offense line. If I hear somebody talk about two first round tackles, I. I I, I will be lucky if that happens. It's one first round tackle yeah, there, right there's now. There's one, and, and look, and, and and not as high as he was. No, two I mean months it's, ago either. it's just once they get down there, you have to be able to run the ball to condense the field. You got to make the linebackers suck up. You got to make the safety suck up. You got to make everybody respect the run. Nobody respects our run game because our, our run game's awful. So like, yeah, I feel more comfortable scoring from the fifty yard line than I do from the fifteen right now because there's open space. Once we condense the field, there's nothing we can do because we don't we don't beat anybody one on one. Like we don't have an elite receiver on this team. There's not an elite receiver. You can talk about Kyron Lacey being good. He he's a possession receiver. He's not a guy that I want to go get move. We talked about the Bengals game the other night. Get me the Jamar Chase one on one, and I'm throwing the ball every time. I don't have that guy on this team. You got to beat somebody with a scheme with something that tricks somebody, with something that fools somebody, or you got to be able to beat them with a run, and we don't have any of that. 499-9898 is the number to call on the LaBarish hotline. We'll take a break, come back with more of your phone calls. Eagle 98.1 game day.
Eagle 98.1 game day continues. Alabama wins at 42 to 13. 499 98 98 is the number to call on the LaBerge hotline. Ryan is in uh, Arkansas. Ryan, welcome into the show. Hey, guys. I would ask how y'all are doing, but I already know how you're doing. I'm feeling it too. I was yes, there. Sir. It was pretty bad. Um, that press conference tonight was very alarming. It felt like a robot up there with speech. <laughs> like he was reading it off a board. It It felt like just a recording the same thing over and again and again. Uh, the coaching better, when he says that, it feels like you're taking words and stick them to a piece of paper with Scott State bubblegum and paper clips at this point. It's just kind of – it was – you know, we stayed there the whole game. It, it, I'm, I'm going to go back to – I said this a couple weeks ago. I called in. I, I just think some of these issues – yes, the offensive line is, as a whole right now, it's not working together at times. There are moments tonight it was there but it's just not there enough. Um, and again, some of the running game I really still feel like is hindered. They backed into Garrett Nussmeyer when they came here, when the staff came here. Garrett Nussmeyer is a great story. I, I don't want to say like I'm taking anything away from him because I, I think he's been great for LSU. He's done great things this year for us. But he's very limited. He's not a guy that wants to run the RPO system the way Sloan. If you look at who they've recruited, that's what they want. And it just – it limits a lot. It does. It makes it so much easier for a defense. I mean, look at what we did for the first half last week or two weeks ago against A&M. When you got a guy that, you know, he may scramble or attempt to sometimes but is not willing to a lot, that's what you get, and you shut him down. And I worry that we're getting to a point with Garrett that people are figuring him out. And that interception in the end zone was the exact same play where they drop back in zone after they fake a blitz and he throws it right to him. That was demoralizing when you get down there at the second half. That and the offensive line being great, yeah, I'm with Richard. I think it sucks right now. It's I think we got one first-round guy up there. I mean, Emory Jones, maybe two, but it's – I mean, I want y'all's opinion. I don't think we're getting more and more talented on the offensive line. We're, we're, we got depth there now. So, I mean, y'all tell me. I'm going to let it go and – figure out from y'all what y'all think but it just seems like the offensive line this isn't a rebuild issue you're i mean this should be a program to some point we're reloading we're in year three and it's it's concerning that our leaders which are third year starters like veterans like campbell are getting false start penalties still you know because your younger guys it affects on the sideline it yeah. that's the stuff that alarms me all right um, your leaders are doing that let, let me, okay thank you for the call um i agree with the most, I agree with just about everything you said. I mean, it's to me, Nussmeyer doesn't fit what, and it, it, it's really hard to say what they want to do because we had Jaden Daniels for the first two years, and he's an elite player. Look, look what he's doing in the NFL. You're going to run every offense around what a guy like that can do. But if that's what they want to do, then Nussmeyer is not the guy for what they want to do in that offense. And, look, I'm not talking taking a shot at Nussmeier. Nussmeier has a great arm. He can make elite plays. But he's very limited in this style of offense when you're going to continue to run a zone read that he doesn't pull the ball. I want to read this quote from Kalen DeBoer in the post game. He says, I think we just had to keep mixing it up in terms of what LSU was seeing Nussmeyer is a great quarterback, but we can kind of predetermine a little bit where the ball may go. They've done it two weeks in a row. I mean, you, you saw what Elko did. Elko is another great defensive mind, and they've started to trick him. We saw one early on on a Aaron Anderson broke up an interception earlier in the game. We talked about he threw two. He could have thrown five tonight, but the very first one was they played a man face, and then he broke off into his own coverage, and Nussmeyer threw it right to his right to the guy's face mask, and, and Anderson had to break it apart. I don't know if they have great depth on the offensive line or not. The, the backups really have not played. You were building towards this year. The whole idea behind, well, not that you had a ton of options, but when you put Jones and Campbell in as, as true freshmen, okay, they won those jobs. They, yeah. were, the, they were the best linemen. And you bring in uh, uh, Frazier from a it was a, it was a transfer, and Dellinger had been here the, the year prior. This was the year you're building towards. When you have four guys that have started, I think it was somewhere around 110, 115 games between them, this was supposed to be that year. 
Do they have great? They've got a lot of highly rated recruits behind them, and almost none of them have played. Mubenga's been forced into play the last couple of weeks. Tyree Adams played a little bit earlier in the year before he got hurt. But I don't know if they have a great depth or not. They, they've got a lot of bodies. They, they've got, you know, they, they've got a lot of highly rated guys. Can they play or not? I don't know. Most of them haven't really seen the field. It's a, it's a mindset and philosophy, though. I mean, I don't know if these guys are road graders to where they're taught to just beat somebody up front. I mean, I go back to – we can go back to 07. The guys we had, we had one offensive lineman drafted off that team, and it was Herman Johnson who got drafted in the second or third round. We dominated the line of scrimmage. Now, we also joke about that we weren't the best pass-protecting guys, but you know we didn't have to deal with that. But it, it is a mindset of beating the guy in front of you. And, you know, I, I, it, it is so frustrating to me because I had such high hopes on this offensive line. And, look, we do have guys who are graded highly in the NFL, whatever they, they want to look at, when you're talking about passing. But there's no push. There's no anger. There's no aggression. I don't see anybody whooping anybody's ass up front. BC is in Baton Rouge. BC, welcome into the show. Uh, good evening, Charlie. Uh, how are you guys doing this evening? Wonderful. Couldn't be better. Could be asleep. All, <laughs> all hail the king of the Cheez It Bowl. Yeah, Ryan Galley. Um, so I have a couple of questions. First off, what can we learn for these next three games? So you've got a, a Florida team that's obviously down to his third string quarterback. Vandy, who's Vandy and actually improved, but still not great. And Oklahoma, who's having one of their worst years in the last 25. So what can we genuinely learn about Brian Kelly, this football program, and this team specifically going forward for the next three weeks? And the other question that I have is when you're you're going to lose the majority of this offensive line, you may or may not lose your quarterback at the end of the season. What kind of footing does the program as a whole stand on when we're transit making another transition to a whole new offense potentially again next year? How do we how do we achieve growth in the, in other words? Then I'll hang up and listen. Thank you guys. Thanks. I think what you can find in the last three games is I'm trying to think of a, a, a nicer way to say this. But there's not really a nicer way to say this, so I'm gonna say it like this. You're gonna find out who doesn't want to quit. You're going to find out who 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 is mentally engaged, who's focused, who goes out there and you know doesn't have some you know little malingering injury that keeps them out of the next couple of games, or you know starts you know has already got one foot in the transfer portal or whatever. Um, the next three games are not going to determine Brian Kelly's future here. It's not going to. It's not going to change our mind on the talent level of of any of these guys. I mean, seriously, what if one of the lesser used receivers goes out and has eight catches against Oklahoma? All right, great, but you still got to start over again next spring. To me, it's a the one thing you can see is: Are you going to stick with it, or are you just going to kind of mail it in because the you, the big goals are off the board now? Are you still mentally engaged? Do, do, do I want to strap it? Uh, you know, do, do I want to strap the gear on with you next year? Where are? You, where, where's your head? Because th- it's hard to stay focused when, like I said, the big goals are off the board. So I think you can t- you can you it, can see some of that. At this point, you're playing for draft picks. You're playing for film. These guys are going to. I'm not cashing it in. I'm putting the best film forward for when the scouts look at me, and the other guys are saying. I'm trying to prove that I'm the guy for next year. That's all. That's all you're looking at. I mean, I, I don't look. We're not playing for a big bowl game anymore. Like the bowl games outside the 12 game playoff, it, it's done. You're looking for the players are playing for draft draft film and spots next year. But what I want to see from Brian Kelly is continue to coach the team and continue to make them better. Because you know, I'm looking at guys. I I, I tweeted something earlier. I'm like I'm watching guys to see how we're going to be next year. Because in my mind, once you went to a 12-game playoff, I don't give a damn about the bowl game. The bowl game means nothing to me. Right, yeah. uh, and I, I think most people feel that way. Yeah, now. so like if you're outside the 12, I'm looking for who's going to be there for next year, who's going to improve, and how are you going to coach it? Because we need to see better coaching as well, not just better playing. I don't know that there's upperclassmen that I'm going to put on a bench right now 
if there's some freshman that I'm no, dying no, no, to no. see. I, I said that as a player. Like yeah. when people talk about like cashing it in, those seniors, those older guys, they're not cashing it in. They got to put up good film. Right. So these guys, like their motivation is we're not playing for a championship. We're not playing for the playoff. We don't give a damn about the bowl game, but I got to put my best film going forward. 499-9898 is the number to call on the LaBeige hotline. Jules is in Abbeville. Jules, welcome into the show. Well, uh, it's better to throw up on yourself than to poo on yourself because then you have to yell for somebody to bring you some kind of song. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Charlie, you, you might have to tell Richard what kind of songs are. <laughs> hey. You know, I've been watching Alabama beat LSU since the early 1960s, and uh, it, it it hasn't changed, you know, say for a couple of years here or there. I mean, we're talking about 60 years, and what have we beat them in those 60 years? Ten times, maybe. <laughs> so, um, I, you know... 2011 was really the last time, in my opinion, that we had a superior type team. Uh, I think the rest of Miles was uh, three and four loss regular season, well, and uh, and you had you had the championship year, but uh, yeah, ni- the 19 team was pretty pretty salty. Yeah, yeah, but that's a 10 year run of a 14 playoff. We made it once, and uh, now we got a 12-team playoff, and with Kelly, I think we'll be lucky if we make it once. Anyway, thank you. Uh, one, 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 out, one out of 10 when it's 12 teams is not is not acceptable, but let me say this about Alabama, okay? It's a good team. It is not a upper echelon uh, now, tonight, notwithstanding okay tonight they rang you out of your own building but the eight games that they played before that is, is there an Alabama team that you've seen under Saban outside of his first one where he was you know cleaning house that this team is is better than that's the most beatable Alabama team since yeah the that, that's the team years uh Saban's team last year wasn't one of his one of one of his bests and they still made the playoff and they still got down to the, the last play with the national champions and, and could have won it. I'll be surprised. This this Alabama team will probably make the playoff because they will. They, they got Auburn and Oklahoma left, which they, they'll win those games. They'll get to 10-2, and two and they'll make the playoff. They may win a game. You send Alabama to, say, Penn State, they probably win that game. But do I think that this is an elite Alabama team? I don't compared to their standards. Do I think that uh, they should have outclassed LSU to this stage? No. I did it in the pregame. We did uh, we did the Open. I said, well, look, what has Alabama done the last four weeks? They've played a two-point game with South Carolina, which is essentially what LSU did, and Alabama's game against South Carolina was in Tuscaloosa. LSU played them in Columbia. They had a game against Tennessee that they lost. They had a game against Vanderbilt that they lost. They blew out Missouri. Missouri was without their starting quarterback. So this is not, to me, an elite Alabama team, but they're still really good. There's not, shouldn't be, 35 points of difference no. between these two teams. There have been years where there, where there was, 35 points of, of difference. There were times where I thought Alabama was so much better. This is a game yeah. that the national media thought we could win. We all thought we could win. Um, you know, they, like Vanderbilt's a good team. They lost to Vanderbilt, lost to Tennessee. They, first time in a long time they came into Tiger Stadium with two losses. I mean, and this was a team that we thought we could play with. I mean, this, this, was, this was embarrassing. I mean, just from the standpoint you of – You should have been able to play with them. We should have – like, I can handle a loss. Not nicely, but I, I right. can handle a loss. This is to me to where we just every all twenty two starters and the coaching staff should be completely embarrassed going home tonight. Four nine nine ninety eight ninety eight is the number to call. Greg is in Baton Rouge. Greg, welcome into the show. Yeah, so Charlie, you talked a little bit about uh, future casting, and and then you stopped yourself short because 
of this you know insurmountable buyout. But you know, just playing the hypothetical game, Charlie, you're it's, you're installed immediately as you know head coach or general manager of the team. You have Elon Elon's checkbook uh, at your leisure, and and so. What, what what do you feel like based on the coaching staff, based on Nussmeyer for next year or not? I mean, what would what would your projections be? Hmm. Uh, if I have Elon's checkbook, I could get Nick Saban for another five, seven, eight years. <laughs> I'd love to have Elon's checkbook even for a minute. I, what, what can you do other than you continue to recruit better, okay? The, the biggest mistake that Brian Kelly made was the staff that he put together upon his arrival on the defensive yeah. side of the ball. They were not good recruiters, and they were not experienced enough coaches. And maybe we should have made a bigger deal about that at the time. They corrected that. Okay, The defensive staff is better. We know that these guys can recruit. We know that they can coach. And for the, the group, so, well, nobody's gotten any better. No, that's not true. Whit Weeks is a better football player now. Braden Swinson's a better football D-line's player now. Better. Savion Jones is a better defense is a better player now. Zion Alexander's a better player now than than when he got to LSU. So there have been guys that ha- have improved. Okay, you got to keep recruiting. You got to upgrade the talent level. This is not the most uber talented roster. Mm-hmm. So all you can do is you, you you've got the defensive staff that you want. But I you, think you've mostly got the offensive staff that you want. Now, Joe Sloan is a, plo, is a play caller in the red zone. I think there's some stuff that you got to look at there. And we've talked about this, uh, you know, to, to death about if you're going to run the zone read, you don't have the quarterback to run the zone read. And, you know, at some point you got to say, well, if you can't run the football, man, look, there's the, the offensive line problems. You groom these guys. You brought them along. You got 115 starts coming into the season, and they can't run block. Okay, you're going to start over. Is the next group better? You just got to keep doing what you're doing as far as recruiting, and what, by that I mean this year. And we did 15 minutes with Shea Dixon in the in the pregame. These are all really highly recruited kids. You got to you got to coach them up. I don't I don't have a quick fix. Yeah. I don't I don't have a well they got to go out and get this one recruit. I mean, they got the number one player in the country here today. He he's, he didn't leave happy, I'm sure. I mean, I, I'm not going to get into that. Yeah, I, I I don't know if he left happy or not, but he's pretty firm in his in his yeah. commitment. So, I don't I, there's not like a, a wave of magic wand. It's not if Brian Kelly decided to retire tomorrow, I don't have one guy that's on my list that I am like, man, Go get that guy. No, but let's let's talk about the recruiting aspect from it is is when this offense was great, and we blamed the defense the first two years. But you had Malik Neighbors, Brian Thomas, Jaden Daniels. We're lacking on the offensive talent as well right now. I think Caden Durham's an elite player. The offensive line is pretty good at pass blocking. We can't do anything in the run game. But, look, I like Kyron Lacey. He's a great possession guy. He's my number three just like he was last year. We don't have a one or two right now. This is the first time in years that we don't have a Kayshawn Booty. I mean, even when he fell off. But we had receivers for so many years, Jamar Chase, Joe, uh, Jefferson, Malik Thomas, all these guys that made stretch the field, made big plays, made quarterbacks better. Name a great quarterback in the NFL with a bad receiver. They don't have them. you got to have both sides of the, the aspect to be great and – I think that's where we're lacking right now, but there's also, you know, a multitude of things because if you can't move the ball in the run game, you make everything harder in the pass game. So you have to ask yourself, or so why don't you have, you know, uh, receivers of that magnitude? Well, you had a class uh, where Sheldon Sampson was a, a five-star recruit and is, is not playing for you. And Kyle Parker was a very highly recruited kid who played a little bit for you at the beginning of the season and got hurt and is is out uh, for the year. You had uh, one kid transferred out. To Miami. Uh, yeah, I'm blanking on his name. Brown. Right? His uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, that's three that were all up at the, 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 the very, very top. You know, last year they asked, why didn't you recruit Keon Coleman, who was from Opelousas? Well, you had neighbors. You had Tom in in that class, yeah. not not last year. In in that class, neighbors. You had Thomas. 
you had um, uh, help me out here. I'm, I'm trying to remember who else was in that class. Um, well, Chris Hilton kid, was in the class. Chris Hilton, the Chris Hilton was the highest one. And a kid from Mississippi, Smith. That, uh, Deion uh, Smith. Deion Smith. Um, so you had those four guys who were all monster guys, okay? So one of them transfers out. One of them has been battling injuries, and the other two were first-round picks. You don't have that on this team. I just rattled off some names to you. Why is that? I don't I don't know. Um, are you it, not? It's it's tough. I mean, look, Chris Hilton was rated higher than Brian Thompson. Than all Lee. of those guys. Yeah, I mean, and then Dion, he had great issues. Went to junior college, supposed to be at Ole Miss, had issues there. There's a crap shoot, but it's also one of those things is it's just hard to see an LSU team without elite receivers. And, uh, you know, kind of, uh, I'm not trying to bash the receivers we have. We just don't have the guys that are go win me one on one. I'm gonna throw you the ball deep every time, and I expect you to make a play 60 percent of the time. But if you're asking me what I do with Elon's checkbook, I'm gonna go get the guys that they're recruiting now. Yeah, it's not like they're recruiting uh, against uh, you know group of five schools. They're when they get a when they get a commitment, it's guys that Georgia's recruiting or Florida's recruiting or Texas is recruiting or whoever. I'd go out and get the best players that I could get. I think they're they're trying to do that. The development on, on some of them has worked and on some of them it had. My biggest question tonight, and I would say to if we're gonna question in, in the realm where we're at, is Joe Salone and, and Brian Kelly is they took Durham off the field for a lot of this game. And look that first drive I I text you, they went into pistol, he breaks a long one, he breaks another one for twelve. He had fifty five yards in the first drive or second first two drives of the game, and then it's like he disappeared. They went back to Josh Williams. They went back to the pass protector. They went back to the guy that they were comfortable with back there, and then they couldn't move the ball. That's something to me. I mean, they were running the ball well early in this game, and where it disappeared, I don't understand why. 499-9898 is the number to call on the LaBear's hotline. We'll take a break. Eagle 98.1 game day. Eagle 98.1 game day continues. Alabama wins it 42 to 13. 499 is the number. On the LaBerge hotline, Matthew is in New Orleans. Matthew, welcome in the show. Hey, thank you so much. All right, so on the ratio of coaching to talent, like what is it good players or good coaching? Like what, what makes a team? I'd rather have great players um, and an average coach than average players and a great coach. 100%. Um, if that answers your question. It, it just looks like at times, so when Nick Saban on game day today said, I'm going to go with my team because it was the players I recruited, he felt almost overly confident when he made that statement. That was political. Yeah. Did, did you all see that? Yeah, yeah I, I, mean, I, I saw it. He um, can't dog out the guys he recruited. He brought all those guys to Alabama. He's got to stick with them, and I completely respect what he's saying. And uh, you know, But for the most part, you got to have great players that are coached well. Like You can have great players that are coached okay, and you can win eight, nine games. But you got to have – if you have great players that are coached great, that's when championships come around. But if you get, like, the good guys – like uh, the rah rah attitude, the team players. Like, uh, I'm not a player. You guys have been on the, that side of the football. Like, can you overcome good players if you have like the right like camaraderie, the right like team? It helps you win a few games. It helps keep them, it helps keep the locker room together. I mean, you got to have a mix of both. You got to have elite players. You got to have the guys that are there to help you practice better. Because what people don't realize when you're recruiting a team. There's when I played, there was 80 scholarship guys on the team, 29, 35 guys played. But the guys that were really good, that were on the scout team, they made you better every day. You had to practice against guys that were with elite talent, and those were guys that maybe not ever made the field. There were guys that practiced for four years that you practice against. But I mean, it's it's a combination of things. But I mean, great coaching and great players is what makes championship. Thank you for the call. I- there, there, there are shows we come in here and you say, well, the, uh, the, the coaches get blamed. And, and look, that, that's part of the gig. And there, there have been a lot of times where I've taken up for not just these coaches, but other coaches. And I say, look, man, you know, 
All you can do is call a play. You can't throw the ball. You can't make the tackle. You can't make the catch. Uh, the special team stuff, you know, from a, a couple of weeks, two weeks ago against A and M, well, they weren't coached to snap the ball right in the the you know the holder's face. They weren't coached to you know spin the laces sideways. You know, at, at some point the players have to take some responsibility for this stuff. Tonight's game. I, I put 150% on the coaching staff. That team was not prepared. I know, okay, I have eight games of evidence, valuable evidence, like Buford T. <laughs> Justice would say. I got eight games of evidence that they're better than that. Yeah. I mean, or, or would they beat, if these two teams played 10 times, would, would LSU beat them, you know, four or five or six? I don't know, but I know they're not five touchdowns worse than that Alabama team. And the, the, the players made mistakes, to be sure, tonight. But they look so out of sorts, so bewildered, so flat-footed, so just, I, I keep coming back to the word bewildered. They looked confused. They looked completely ill-prepared to play this game. This is on, this one is on the coaches. This this game, this one's on the coaches. I agree with you. And, like, I'm going to sound like the idiot the way that Jalen Miller ran up and around that defense, but... The offense tonight was so bad. Both both sides. And, but the way the defense started is we were stopping the running back carry game. We stopped them early on. And then, you know, Milro broke a few. And then it felt like as the game got on, the, the, the gates just flooded and, and everybody just it got worse. But, like, <clears throat> this is the worst offensive performance I've seen in three years under Brian Kelly. It's – they were trying so hard to score a touchdown at the end because it's been six years since they didn't score yeah. a, a touchdown. It was the Alabama game, the, the the game that Burrow was hurt. Basically, he was playing, you know, yeah, ba- six years, uh, six six years uh, ago. Uh, Four nine nine ninety eight ninety eight. LaBear's hotline. Kevin is in Baton Rouge. Kevin, welcome into the show. Hey guys, um, got two questions, man. First one is something I've noticed this uh, entire season, and maybe I'm nitpicking, but. The, uh, our passing game, to me, it seems like about 75% or so of our passes are out, long passes across the field out to the flats. Or if it's downfield pass, it's up against the boundaries. Uh, pretty much most of our passing game, but we don't use the middle of the field at all. Is there a reason for that? Is that just a poor – I don't get it. But our question is, Joe Sloan, in my opinion, is just – he's in over his head uh, at this point. But – we're kind of tied with Bryce Underwood's recruiting recruitment, so tied to him. Is he around next year as offensive coordinator, or is he downgraded to maybe quarterbacks coach again? How do you deal with that? And then that passing game again. Do you notice that most of our passes are to the boundaries or to the flats, and that's about it? Well, your, pa- your passing game coordinator is Cortez Hankton. I mean, and look, Joe Sloan's got a part in all of that, but I, I disagree. I mean, Anderson's biggest plays of the year all across the middle. Some of our biggest pass plays were Mason Taylor. Uh, Mason Taylor yeah. across the middle. Um, we've thrown a lot of touchdowns over the middle of the field deep. And, that, yeah, and I get what you're talking about as far as our go-to plays or comeback routes or guys sitting on the edge. To me, it all boils down to is if you can't run the ball and bring linebackers up and bring safeties up, then it kind of limits the field of where you can go. I think what he maybe what he's trying to say is nothing's easy. Nothing's there, easy. There, and there, I agree there's, with that 100%. There's not nothing is this little quick hitter that anybody could throw. And and Kelly said, I think it was week before last, we don't have a whole lot in the screen game because we've got elephants on roller skates as offensive linemen. You and I on the film looked at some of the screen game stuff that they ran against USC. They did it early in this game. They did it in this game. They we brought it back. We threw some outside screens to uh, Josh Williams, and we do those things. But like, but the, and the linemen don't have to away. get out. The, the, these are these are bunch formations yeah. where the, the the receivers are out there blocking. I'll give you an example of one of the plays that frustrated me tonight, and this is before the game got out of hand. This was right at the beginning of the third uh, the uh, second quarter, and LSU had a third down and four at their own thirty four yard line. And they had to call timeout because the play clock was running down. So they come out of the they come out of the timeout, which they never intended to call, but had to. And the play ends up being a about a 
25-yard out to Kyron Lacey that had no chance yeah. at all. This was a third and four. At, at, at this point in the game, it's 14-3, to three, and you really need to keep the ball. You, you really need to pick up a first down here. And you got no play. I bring up the point in the game it was because you hadn't used – I don't even know if they were through the script at this point because Alabama had the ball the, the whole first quarter. Let me look at this. They At that point, they had run 11 plays. So they're, they're not even through the script yet. They got their first 20. Yeah. Still. They're not even through the script, and this is what they're, they're running. Out of a timeout on third down and four, this very high degree of difficulty, low percentage pass. Now, if you hit it, wonderful. Okay? You, you, you're going to pick up 25 yards. But is that really, at this point in the game, it's 14-3. to three. You desperately need to keep the football. You're not through the script, and you don't have a higher percentage pass play in your pocket than that. See, where, where I want to go back and look and mark that play down because this goes back to decision-making by the quarterback. There was another play, and it was a third and four. Don't know if we're talking about the same play. He threw it deep. To an out guy, I can't remember where he went, but he had Mason Taylor cross in the middle of the field at five. I think that was, and it, it was for third and four, but I think that was later in the game. Okay, but there, there was multiple times where he's got to take the easy stuff. I feel like in the last you know couple games, Nussmeyer is pressing so bad to make that deep play and make the deep ball that he, he gives up on the easy stuff when there's stuff that you can drop off to to your intermediate routes and just keep the ball going and keep the um, keep the possession rolling. I, I don't buy. The, the screen game is not a real viable option because for them because of the there. offensive lineman. Yeah, I think that there's other ways you can throw screens. You know, you can throw bubble screens. You can. I want the ball in Xavier Thomas's hands as many times as freaking possible. I mean, no. he's to me, he's the most electric player on the field. We saw what he did in the kickoff return game today. He's a guy that just doesn't go down easy. We, we, we put in a, a little special run play for him. We might have had a, another carry for him. But when he gets the ball in his hand, he makes things happen. He's a guy that needs to be so much more involved in the offense than we're giving the opportunity to be. I'll give you another uh, screen example that doesn't require linemen to pull. And it was a play that you guys ran all the time. Uh, and it I don't ever remember it not working. It was that little middle peekaboo screen, to mostly to Charles Scott. Yeah. And I, I, I don't ever remember it not working. You and, and you only ran it maybe once a game, but it was always in one of those crucial situations. And Scott always caught the ball, and he always made a first down. I mean, I, if if he ever didn't, I don't remember it. That's a very easy play to to execute, or no. at least, or at least you guys made it look easy. Oh well, yeah, and I mean you had that, but every run play we had had a check bubble. I mean, we we had thirty four zone check bubble. 35 zone check bubble. Everything was, if you got guys playing off on the outside, you had soft coverage, we were going to throw it to the inside receiver and let one guy block, and it was a, it was an outside run play that you were going to get five to seven yards. And it's there. We, we've seen them run it in the USC game and didn't realize it until we went back and watched the film. But getting away from that, just the quick stuff, dumping it off to the receiver, letting me go make a play, give me that was a Zion Thomas five to seven times a game. It's something that's going to be out there that you can, you know, just make the easy yardage. We're brought to you by Supreme Rice and SupremeRice.com. The holiday season is coming up. Try the new Pawball Rice. It's the closest thing you're going to get to restaurant-quality rice. Available at Rouse's, at Walmart's, and all the places that you buy rice. The new Pawball Rice from Supreme Rice. Also, the, the jasmine, the brown, the long grain, the medium grain, they're all delicious. Pick your favorite flavor, uh, as they say. For your A2 phase, your red beans and white beans, your gumbos, uh, your your stews, and again, as we get uh, closer towards the holidays, and you're going to be uh, supporting our Louisiana farmers because Supreme Rice is grown, milled, and processed uh, down in Southwest Louisiana. It has been since the 1930s. They're part of the Climate Smart Program. It's talking about reducing methane emissions and promoting water conservation for future generations of Louisiana farmers. For more information and great recipes, go to SupremeRice.com. Take a break. More of your phone calls when we return. Eagle 98.1 game day. Eagle 98.1 game day continues. Alabama wins it 42 to 13. 
Another, uh, we had an unbeaten fall earlier today in Miami. Another one on the ropes here. BYU trailing by two with 55 seconds to go, but they are inside the Utah 30 yard line. They're to 27 with 50 seconds to go. So we'll keep you uh, up to date on what happens at the end of this game. 499 98 98 is the number to call. Uh, Mike is in Texas. Mike, welcome into the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Um, came in late on this and stuff. If you already addressed it, just let me know. But um, one thing I've noticed over Brian Kelly's season, I guess this year, is during his press conferences, he's always said, I need to coach better. We need to coach better. You know, we need to be better as a coaching staff. And, I mean, we heard it again tonight. At what point do we need to hold that accountable? I know we're not getting rid of him or anything, but at what point is that more of an excuse now than – a game plan change because I'm tired of hearing it. It just rubs me wrong. I know it's more of a comment, but I'd love Let me, to no, no, wait, hang on. Don't, don't, don't hang up. I, I want to ask yeah, you sure. a question. What, what, what would have made you feel better? And I, I'm not, I'm not trying to be smart. Out no, no. Uh, what, what, because there, there's a few things you can do in the post game press conference. He can go in there and he can take the blame and he can say, we need to coach better. And it's on me. He can go in there and he can say, Listen, you know, my quarterback threw a couple interceptions and my safety, you know, for some reason, you know, takes bad angles all the time. And, you know, then that's called throwing the players under the bus. He can go in there and, and throw a tantrum and pound on the table, which he did against USC. And he got, <laughs> he got you know, criticized for that. I, for myself, after watching that game, there is nothing Brian Kelly could have said in that press conference short of, uh, hello, uh, you know, thank you for coming to the post game press conference. Is Charles Hanegriff in the room here? Because I'd like to write him a million dollar check. That would have made me happy. Anything else that he says, I'm mad. I, I'm aggravated. So, uh, not to to dodge a question or anything, but there's not anything he could have said in that press conference that would have made me feel any better. So, I guess you you I guess you have proved my point to to the point both of our frustrations are at because. Yeah. You're right, because he could have said anything, and it's just I'm tired of hearing the same answer, same in, day out. As am I. As am I. I agree with you, and to, yeah. you, to your point, this is the third time this season we've heard that. Like after every loss, we got to coach better, and I get to Charlie's point too, because you can't throw the players under the bus because then you get a bad rep. You can't throw a fit, but there 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 is a way to say it with saying coaching better, but there's also a way to you know make your players accountable too. I mean, like w when I was in the NFL. They told you when you play bad. They they told you when a guy didn't do the right thing. But there's also a way of doing it the the right way. And I'm I'm kind of in between with what both y'all are saying. I agree with what you're saying. I agree with what Charlie's saying. But it's also you to say, hey, we got to play better. We yeah. have to do better things. Those guys got to make that tackle. Nuss, you cannot throw that interception. You you can say things without throwing them completely under the bus. But I, I'm so tired of hearing. We got to coach better as well. This is a this is a soul searcher. I mean, you you got embarrassed, and, and again, I think that that word gets overused well, a lot. They are yeah. they should be embarrassed. Former players are embarrassed. I've talked to them. I've been texting to them. Like this is you know I'm getting text messages saying right now we are playing Notre Dame football, and I don't want because I hate Notre Dame more than anything. When people are texting me saying we look like Notre Dame, I don't want to hear that. I I, I didn't want to hear. The Jalen Milrow beat you with his legs. Yeah. I, 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 that that to me is the most infuriating thing. After he beat you last year, this year he had thirty more yards than he had last year on eight fewer carries. He broke he, a seventy-five yarder at the end. Seven, Seventy-two a thirty-nine yeah, yeah. yarder. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that's nothing that we can be can be accepted. I I, I can't believe that after last year's game and after last week's game, you know, two weeks ago against A and M. These running quarterbacks beat you, and you didn't have a better plan than that. That's absolutely. The only thing I'll say about that is it's completely different from the A and M game to this. I thought what Alabama did was very interesting, faking the handoff and then having the running back be the lead blocker. But either, either that or then whatever you got to stop it. I'm watching uh, this. Uh, the, the 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 pitchy pitchy woo woo uh, BYU kicked the field goal by the way they had a kickoff to Utah uh, stay on the field. half a dozen or more laterals there's a flag on the field anyway and it's down so BYU is going to survive twenty two to twenty one is uh, 
check that penalty for us, but I think uh, I think that's on Utah. So they're going to survive, and they're going to get to nine and zero. Oh. Lance is in Shreveport. Lance, welcome into the show. Hey, how y'all doing? Hey, good. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, Not really, but you know. Yeah. It's something yeah, to say. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, pretty embarrassing. Uh, just quick. I mean, there's not a whole lot. <laughs> I have a ton of questions, but, uh, just one for brevity. Um, okay. So Sloan and, uh, Nussmeyer, uh, it seems like he has no deep ball. I understand that his, the receiving, uh, core is not what we what we're used to having. Uh, and when he throws the deep ball, you might as well just make a second and 10 because I mean, he hadn't completed a ton of them. Uh, in the decision making, um, I think the previous caller had mentioned or commented how he had, uh, or maybe it was uh, y'all, how he had Mason open in the middle of the field. How much of this do you put on Nuss, and how much of this do you put on Sloan? I mean, because it seems to me again that Nuss is just trying for the home run almost every time he goes out there. And dude, if he, I don't see how we can't complete little, you know, four or five yards. Uh, passes and just chip away down the field. Uh, I mean, with 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 Mason and especially with Trey Dez. I mean, good lord! I mean, we got some talent there. Um, I understand you don't have the deep threat, but I mean, we got some. So I'll hang up and listen. Thanks. This one's for you. Yeah, I mean, I think Nussmeier. You know, we can go back and break down every deep ball he's thrown. When he's had guys open, he's overthrown them, underthrown them. He's not a good deep ball thrower. Where I think he's good is intermediate crossing routes, putting balls in places in between defenders. But uh, that's not his strength. He is I'm trying to say it the best way possible. We don't have the the receivers to go deep ball to where a guy can just throw it up and let the guy go make a play. He has to make it a perfect throw on the deep ball, and that's not where he's good at. The, the ball fades a little bit on him. Uh, now he he'll put some air under it, but the, the ball fades on he him. He throws a little it bit. too far, throws it too short. Like he never, he doesn't have that six two six three guy that can go up and make a big play. I mean, he has to throw it perfect, but he's made bad decisions. Also, what he talks about. I mean, he threw the deep ball tonight on a second and four, third and four, whatever it was, when he needed a first down. Like he, he's made bad decisions lately, and. We can all pile on him over the last six quarters. The last six quarters have been the worst football he's played as an LSU Tiger. Previous to that, people were talking about, is, is he leaving early because he's a first-round draft pick? So, I mean, there's an in-between to where he's got elite talent, he's got first-round ability, but he doesn't have the consistency of being a great quarterback day in and day out right now. 499-9898 is the number. Kenyon uh, is in uh, central Louisiana. Kenyon, welcome into the show. Hey man, uh, this, as a season ticket holder, you know this this game was hard to watch. I mean, we've been out coached uh, with uh, USC at the beginning of the year was totally out coached, unprepared for those guys, and you know just it's frustrating to to watch. But what about our second string quarterback? Why don't you? Why you know once we seen that Nussmeyer wasn't doing the things he needed to do. Why haven't we went to our backup quarterback and gave him an opportunity like Texas A&M did with their quarterback? I'm going to hang up and let y'all Thank answer that. Thank, Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, in this game, I would have liked to have seen them just letting us have a seat. The issue had been decided. I would have liked to have seen Ricky Collins get – Get in the game just because Nussmeyer needed to probably sit. There wasn't a whole lot Nussmeyer for him to gain. Needed to sit. Taylor needed to sit. Yeah. Like, the most frustrating part of this, and we kind of talked about it off air, is I thought that outside of getting embarrassed, embarrassed on the field, embarrassing the program was having your starters out there against the second team, Alabama, yeah. trying to score a touchdown at the end. I wish Ricky Collins would have got in there, moved the ball a little bit. Um, he's not the savior. I don't think he's the guy that you, you're going to put in like A&M did to come in and win the game. But at that point, we just needed to let those guys get off the field and, you know. Yeah, the, fi- finish the game. Yeah. Let, let, give them a reward for, you know, practicing all that stuff. And, and us needed to sit at that point. There's not a whole lot to to gain from it. I um, Nuss needed to reflect. I mean, he, yeah, he needs to sit yeah. on the bench and be like, I got to reset myself because he, he put the team in bad situations. He, it was time for him. But so – 
but why they didn't do that, I I, I don't know. I, I, well, I guess I do know. They want to score. A they want to score a touchdown. That's more embarrassing. Yeah, than that, the that's, again. that's irritating. Uh, Bill is in Hammond. Bill, welcome into the show. Hey, Charles and Richard. Um, just um, I'm not going to be as astute as some of the other callers. I don't follow it that closely, and I can't get into schemes. And sometimes I can't even watch that many plays, but. Back to your uh, original description, Charlie, with bewilderment. Uh, you said that uh, Milro had eight fewer carries but 30 more yards. Than, than the game last year, yeah. Okay, go back and look at – I felt like I was watching a replay. All, I thought it was um, in, in Groundhog Day. <laughs> Every time I turned it on, he kept running for a touch. Uh, did he ever get – how many? I can get – I can understand somebody breaking tackles and running over you and eluding you like Michael Vick. Nobody touched the guy a lot of times. Well, how how is that possible? That's bewilderment to me. That's, you that's you possible. you you were not alone uh, tonight. Here's another play that aggravated me. This was in the fourth quarter. Alabama had the ball. It was thirty-five to six at this point, and they were playing a third down and two at their own twenty-eight yard line. Now the issue. This is this with ten minutes to go in the game, so the issue has been decided. This is just how fast can we get this over with? And he ran his own read, and he kept it, and they tackled him for a five yard loss. Hard to believe. A, a lot <laughs> of people had given up by that point, and I wouldn't blame you. And uh, you know, Fowler and Herb Street are great. Uh, and thanks for the shout out, guys. Uh, the, the the sympathetic how words at the would end. It be to be a yeah, post game, uh, right? The post game guy. <laughs> thanks for that. Um, but uh, they said at uh, Herb Street said at that point. On this play, they've made sure that Milrow is not going to beat them. I think it was Weeks and might have been Swenson, might have yeah. been Jones. I don't remember. They had three guys over there. They tackled him. The running back was by himself. If he had handed the ball away, the running back might have gained 40 yards. Who knows? And said so They made absolutely sure that Milrow wasn't going to beat him. A little too late. Way too late. And, and that's when I want – you had times where you were aggravated. That one was where I was aggravated. It's like, that's what I wanted to see in the first quarter, okay? If you're going to run this zone, and it wasn't all zone read. Some of it was just quarterback keeps. The the, 30, quarterback the 39 yard was was a quarterback foul. I'm going to hit Jalen Milrow every chance you give me. And if the running back tears me up for 175 yards, so be it. But I've already watched this guy beat me. And I've watched a guy like him at least from a running quarterback standpoint, beat me two weeks ago. Quarterback's not going to beat me again. Beat me some other way. I'm going to put everybody up at the uh, at the top. You throw the ball over my head, go right ahead. And they had opportunities to throw the ball over their head. And Milrow missed on a couple of those balls. Go go back and go back and look. These were these were first and second quarter balls. Williams is behind. The, and that was raining. Okay, but he missed those throws. He ain't they, gonna mess with his legs. They were throwing Ever. him deep. Why weren't we throwing him deep? I mean, why? Why you just said it because he, 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 he didn't throw the, the deep ball? On yeah, him. I mean, so to me, we can go back to all that. You know, we got beat up front on both sides of the ball. Mm -hmm. Our D tackles got manhandled. The ends got handled for the most part. You know, on the opposite side, our tackles got handled. Our guard and centers didn't know what they were doing. At some point, I mean, there were guys running right by him, and they're looking just shuffling back and forth. I mean, it was an embarrassment up front. The the sack that caused the fumble, okay? We haven't really talked about game situations uh, all that much because it it got out of hand. But after the fourth down you stop. You get a fourth down stop. You get a fourth down stop, and the, the very next play, the pressure comes right up the middle, and Chester is blocking nobody. He's pointing at I don't know what. Had yeah, blindfolds on at that and, point, and I mean, the and, and the 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 defensive back comes right up the a gap. Yeah, and he never sees him. He's just kind of <laughs> scanning around, looking. Who are you of, supposed to be blocking? Very frustrating to me. Just from like, I mean, aren't you supposed to, if you are in the center and if I'm you're not blocking somebody, you're supposed to have blitz pick up. Look, any time that you're not blocking somebody, you're looking for somebody to block. And, and that one to me is unexcusable. It's a, it was almost like he pointed at him as he, as he went by. He said, hey, Nuss, look out for him. Right. You know I mean? <laughs> Duck. Yeah. We got to laugh, man, because ooh, otherwise uh, 
you just start screaming. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back uh, with more Eagle 98.1 game day. Eagle 98.1 game day. Stat check. Presented by Luba Workers Comp. Luba Workers Comp. Delivering genuine dependability. This segment is a testimonial to meaningless yards. You ready for this one? First downs, 23 for Alabama, 22 for LSU. It was close, right? No. Total yards, 420 to 343. Is it that close? No. Passing yards, 109 for Alabama, 239 for LSU. Rushing 311 yards for Alabama, 104 for LSU. Seven penalties for the Tide at 74 yards, seven for 65 at LSU. Three turnovers for LSU to none. Time of possession, 3355 for the Tide, 2605 for LSU. Third down. Wow. Boy, I missed this one earlier. Third down efficiency, 10 of 13 for Alabama. 10 of 13. That makes sense. I feel, I feel like I felt that stat. That first game, uh, uh, he coached down a Superdome against uh, Florida State. They were something like 11 of 14 yeah. or something like that. Yeah, it was it was very much like that tonight. All right, let me get this out of the way. Jalen Milrow, 12 of 18, 109 yards. Through the air, Nussmeyer, 27 of 42, 239, a touchdown and two picks. Milrow ran 12 times for 185 yards, 15.4 yard average, four touchdowns, along a 72. Uh, again, for context, last year he ran 20 times for 155 yards. So, again, eight fewer carries, 30 more yards. Uh, Jam Miller, 13 carries for 38 yards. They had four other backs that uh, they gained at least 12 yards. Caden Durham, eight carries for 63 yards. Xavier Thomas, two for 18. Jam Miller caught five passes for 50 yards. Ryan Ryan Williams really wasn't that big of a factor in this game. He, he had threw did for one, 109 yards. Yeah, he, he had the that. one nice punt return. Yeah. Two catches for 29 yards. He did overthrow him on a bomb where he would have had him for a score. Kyron Lacey, five catches for 79 yards in the last touchdown that really aggravated Richard. Mason Taylor, four for 50. And Josh Williams, six catches for 38 yards. Aaron Anderson, three for 27. They have the, they have the no uh, no screens uh, through the ball to backs quite a bit tonight. With weeks, 15 tackles tonight, seven solos, half a tackle for loss. And uh, Campbell, 12 tackles for Alabama, including three for a loss, a sack and a half, a pass defense and a partridge in a pear tree. LSU punted twice uh, for a 40-yard average, and Alabama punted twice for a 45-yard average. This is the whole thing. Real bad. Take a break. Come back. Uh, final <laughs> scoreboard. Eagle 98.1 game day. The Robinson Brothers Ford Lincoln College Football Scoreboard. Robinson Brothers Ford Lincoln on airline under the giant American flag. All right. Everything has gone final. Start up at the top. Number one, Oregon beat Maryland 39-18. to They go to 10-0 on the season. Number two, Ohio State, no problem with Purdue, 45 to nothing. Will Howard through three touchdown passes. Number 16, Ole Miss, fully upset. They beat number three, Georgia, 28-10. to Richard, the way this game started, man, in the first uh, few minutes, Jackson Dart got slammed to the turf. He threw an interception. He went to the injury tent limping. Georgia punched it in for a touchdown. We're talking about three and a half minutes into the game. It's seven to nothing, Georgia. Jackson Dart's going to the locker room, and man, things look terrible for Ole Miss. From that point on, Ole Miss beat the stew out of them the rest of the day. You had a backup quarterback come in, lead him on a touchdown drive. They Austin Simmons, yeah, that. it was five or six on that drive. There was there was nothing Georgia could do at that point. I mean, Ole Miss started rolling. They really controlled the clock, moved the ball. I mean, I think they had five punts in a row at one point. Dart came back in the game. He threw for 199 yards and a touchdown and ran for 50 yards. Another upset. Georgia Tech beat number four Miami, handed the Canes their first loss of the season, 28-23. to Haynes King, the quarterback, played. They used two quarterbacks today. He ran for 93 yards and a touchdown. Cam Ward, 348 yards in the air and three touchdowns in a losing effort. Charlie, that's where things went wrong for me. I had Georgia lose. Felt good. I had Miami lose. I wanted chaos up front. Yeah, I can't get two wins and then. Congratulations! Yeah, you just little little problem <laughs> after that. Number five, Texas beat Florida forty-nine to seventeen. Five touchdowns 
or Quinn Ewers. Uh, number six, Penn State beat Washington 35-6, to six, bouncing back from their first loss of the season. Number seven, Tennessee handled Mississippi State 33-14. to 14. Number eight, Indiana goes to 10-0 and 0. for the first time in school history. They beat Michigan 20-15. to 15. Curtis Rourke threw for 206 yards and two touchdowns. Number nine, BYU, we told you about this uh, 20 minutes or so ago. They win the Holy War. They beat Utah 22-21, to 21, kicked a field goal with three seconds to go. The Cougars remain undefeated. Number 10, beat, uh, number 10 Notre Dame beat Florida State 52-3. to three. Listen, uh, if you're feeling bad uh, about LSU right now after tonight, you could be at Florida State. They are one and nine. Number 12, Boise State beat uh, Nevada 28-21. to 21. Uh, Ashton Jenny ran for 209 yards and three touchdowns, keep himself in the Heisman conversation. Kansas beat number 17, Iowa State 45-36. to 36. It was Virginia over number 18, Pitt 24-19. to 19. After Pitt opened up 7-0, now they've lost their last two. Number 20, Colorado beat Texas Tech 41-27. to 27. I got to check the tiebreakers, but I think Colorado may be in control of their own destiny. In the Big 12, um, I got I got to check that, but they got a great shot to make the Big 12 championship game if they keep winning, and they're going to be favored, I think, in all uh, of their final three games. Number 21, Washington State beat Utah State 49-28. to Quick, Rich, what's Washington State's record? Um, eight and four and six. You were closer to the first eight, time. Okay. Eight and one. Okay. Is it, they're the quietest eight and one in the country. Yeah. We don't ever talk about Washington State. Not that we need to. <laughs> Number 23, Clemson beat Virginia Tech 24-14. to 14. Number 24, Missouri beat Oklahoma 30-23. to 23. Wild fourth quarter uh, up at Columbia. Oklahoma got a scoop and score to go ahead. Missouri came down, scored a touchdown to tie it, then got a scoop and score of their own to win it. Drew Pine, the former Notre Dame quarterback, started for Mizzou. He threw three touchdown passes. Number 25, Army stayed perfect. They beat North Texas 14-3. to uh, Bryson Daly did play in this game. The Army quarterback, he ran for 153 yards and two touchdowns. Rutgers beat Minnesota 26-19. to It was Boston College over Syracuse 37-31. West Virginia beat Cincinnati 31-24. to Texas State over UL Monroe 38-17. Navy beat South Florida 28-7. Liberty over Middle Tennessee 37-17. UConn over UAB 31-23. Marshall beat Southern Miss 37-3. Duke over NC State 29-19. San Jose State over Oregon State 24 to 13. James Madison beat Georgia State 38 to 7. It was uh, UTEP over Kennesaw State 43 35 in double overtime. Tulane goes to 8 and 2. They stay perfect in the American at 6 and 0. Oh. They beat Temple 52 to 6. South Carolina no letdown at Bandy. They beat the Commodores 28 to 7. Lenora Sellers with two touchdowns. Uh, through the air and rocket sanders with two touchdowns on the ground jacksonville state beat louisiana tech 44 to 37 wild finish jacksonville state had to have a hail mary uh to tie the game missed the extra points so then they had to go to overtime they scored the touchdown in overtime and then get a stop UL Lafayette goes to 8-1 on the season. They stay perfect 5-0 in the Sun Belt. They beat Arkansas State 55-19. Western Kentucky over New Mexico State 41-28. Arizona State beat UCF 35-31. It was TCU over Oklahoma State 38-13. That ensures that Mike Gundy will have his, I believe, his first losing season at Oklahoma State. They're now 3-7. He was hired. Right after Les Miles left Oklahoma State. Been there since 2005. UNLV uh, got uh, by Hawaii 29-27. And Air Force beat Fresno State 36-28. Southern uh, was able to get a victory. I believe this game went to overtime. Southern 25-23 over Bethune-Cookman. Uh, yeah, I, it did go overtime. It went 5 Overtime. That's what, that's what I'm showing here. Five over, fifth overtime, that's 25 to 20. We've seen seven overtimes. And so when, this is uh, with all the two point. You're saying with five overtimes, yeah. they only scored 25 point, two point conversions yeah. after the after the first two. 
Uh, and Grambling beat Alabama State 24-23, to and that is your college football scoreboard. Game balls are next. Eagle 98.1 game day. Eagle 98.1 game day. Game balls. Presented by WCK Foundation Repair. WCK Foundation Repair. Support your home team. WCK Foundation Repair. You first. I'm going with Omar the Tiger. Omar the Tiger. The yeah. most interesting thing that happened today on the field. I'm uh, I'm going with Paul Skeens. I can go with that. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't even know how many of his picks he got right, but I like Paul Skeens. Uh, I enjoyed and watching was... Livy pick the picks a little bit better, but <laughs> I um, I'm I'm going with Skeens. I he was the is the best ball player on campus today. <laughs> <laughs> it's the closest thing to greatness we had. Yeah, it's just. This one was tough, gang. 42-13, to 13, Alabama wins it. We're back to wrap it up. Eagle 98.1 game day. Been a long day. And not a particularly good one uh, where the football was concerned. Uh, Rich, this one, uh, you, you took some tough losses, uh, you know, when you were here. What's the... What, what's the what's the room like tomorrow? What are they What are they walking into? Because it's soul searching. I mean, this yeah. is one you got to figure out. Like we're not who we thought we are, but who can we be? I mean, these guys got to go back in and reestablish who this team needs to be. We'll see. Uh, again, the, the the big goals are pretty much off the board. So this is about pride. This is about. Your what, what what's next? I hate to say it, it becomes a little bit selfish. It's like I got to put the best film going forward. Yeah, either for this team next year or for your your professional uh, prospects. I I get it. Forty two to thirteen. This was going. This was going to stink all week. Uh, for Richard, uh, for Musso, for Jordan. Uh, I'm Charles Hanniger saying thank you and good evening. Football Sunday tomorrow at 10 a.m. Please join us then. Till then, good night, everybody.